Living Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running and nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and I hope all of you are having a great day. Where we kick off today with a show dedicated entirely to graphics, graphics talk, and, you know, a little bit of off-topic, but uh, still an important conversation to have. Uh, you can find full show notes over at ComputerAmerica.com, where it will have a link to anything and everything we discuss today here on the program. So, with, uh, oh, and also, while you're there, be sure to check out the social media contest brought to you by Logitech, and check out the live video feed brought to you by OWC. So, with, uh, with that being said, I think we're not going to waste any time, jump right into it, plenty to talk about, and uh, joining us is a regular here on the show, a correspondent, and, you know, he's, uh, of course, very, very well-versed when it comes to things like, uh, of course, graphics and the like, so with... Uh, so with that being said, let's just bring him on. So Darius Derekshani, again, welcome on to the program. Hey, how's it going? Hey, it's going well, going well. Happy that you could join us. And yeah, so uh, I guess before we get started, for those of us who haven't heard of you, uh, give us a little bit of background on what fills your daytime. Well, um, work. <laughs> lots and lots of work. Um, uh, I teach uh, animation and graphics and visual effects, especially when it comes to uh, film. Uh, and I also do a fair amount of animation and graphics as well. As a matter of fact, I'm uh, steeped in a, a project right now that I'm working on for visualizing some, some um, scientific data, so to speak. Can't get too much into it, but the idea is to help um, to use animation to help visualize the kind of data that is um, that is important for like a construction site, for example, to help people kind of see what they're dealing with in terms of, uh, you know, land and soil and geological formation and stuff like that. And it's a nice mix between using graphics in an illustrative, entertaining way and also in an informative way. And it just kind of goes to show how important it is. I mean, really, a picture is worth a thousand words, so an animation is, I guess, worth 24,000 words a second. <laughs> right. Uh, well, uh, you know, that is the point of, uh, of videos and things like that, where it conveys information uh, very obviously, and, of course, you know, it's very intuitive. So with, uh, so with that being said, um, you know, glad that you could join us, glad that you could take a bit of time out of your day. And yeah, we have a number of articles and discussions and things that, uh, that we wanted to touch on with you. So I think a good place to start, why don't we go ahead and, you know, uh, here on the show, a lot of the back end, uh, be it for audio purposes or for creating, you know, assets for the show and the website, uh, we use Adobe, you know, that's not paid, we're not sponsored by them, but they have a very robust set of products and, you know, it, it always surprises me that I'll, you know, I'm fully entrenched in like Premiere and After Effects and uh, Illustrator. Like, you know, I have my go-to tools, but they have like 15, 20 different ones. And a lot of them I never even touch. And one of those is uh, Adobe Dimension or, you know, Adobe Dimension, uh, yeah, I guess CC stands for the Creative Cloud. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about Dimension. What is it and why and, you know, I guess, what's it for? Because again, I've never used it. Well, you know what clip art is, right? Yes. Where oh, you can yeah. download. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so helpful to lots of people for getting their graphics together, getting their ideas uh, across to other people. So, you know, you download a clip art of a smiley face or whatever, and you go for it. Well, one one of the things with uh, CG and animation in particular, it, it's actually pretty uh, intense. It's pretty complicated. 
There's lots and lots of stuff you have to do. And very slowly over the many, many years that I've been involved, I've been looking at how this industry is trying to be much more of a mainstream mass market. You know, at this point, everybody knows what Photoshop is. And it, it's a verb now. You can Photoshop your friends into a photo or or an X out of a photo. Right. So um, one of the one of the things I was looking at um, many, many months ago was something Adobe was putting out called Project Felix, which was basically the, the beta of what is now Dimension. And that takes the idea of simplifying CG so that people, designers, and, and eventually um, just everybody will be able to incorporate 3D into their workflow. And what I mean by 3D is not just downloading a, a clip art that looks like it's three-dimensional, but an actual 3D model that you can turn and move and, and color differently and light differently. And the idea is a uh, graphic designer, let's say you're trying to uh, convey a, a scene, a tabletop scene, mm -hmm. and you want to place a couple of objects on that table to, to make it look more full and more lush, you would have to find photos of these objects at the right angle, at the right lighting to get it to match in with what your base is. So with this, what you can do is you can actually put in models and light it and say this is made of glass and this is made of metal and this is made of blue plastic and so on and put these things in 3D space to arrange them around and put some lighting and, and uh, textures and, and coloring on them but much, much easier to a point where it's almost clip art-esque mm -hmm. where you can pick your objects, bring them in, manipulate them by moving them around and with some simple lighting tools and powered with a, a good real-time render engine, be able to see, oh yeah, this this um, little chrome, uh, let's say little chrome statue I'm putting on the table is actually looking pretty good. Or this little brushed aluminum headphones um, that I'm trying to visualize uh, are starting to look good because of the simple, the simplicity of of it without having to know how to model something from scratch and know how to create textures uh, for it and getting the textures to look right on the model, which is a, another topic I'd love to talk about later. Um, and then getting it to, to light and render. I mean, they're, they're fairly intricate. I don't want to say too complicated, but they're more intricate than most designers will go for and lots and lots of regular people will, will want to deal with. So I think this is a good... I guess, uh, inching forward into having 3D and 3D space being more of a, a, a public, uh, democratized sort of language that's already built into your computer. We're seeing a little bit of that with uh, the latest Windows 10 updates with the creators update where there's now like a 3D creation tool mm -hmm. and with... Um, 3D printing, people can get excited about printing out their own little figurines and, and little inventions and stuff like that. So I think we're, we're definitely within grasp, um, but the, the software is, is tough for most people without you know training and schooling to really get their heads around easily. So I think this is a really good way of introducing that to a wider masser market. And you think that that wider master market, because you mentioned Photoshop, uh, you know, where maybe before Photoshop, we thought that maybe pho photo manipulation was something that uh, experts do, was something that Hollywood does, was something that, you know, really a select subset of people would really be interested in that. And then after Photoshop came out, after it was more widely available, uh, mm -hmm. we see almost everyone, you know, having some capacity to edit their own photos, you know, be it to reduce, you know, uh, certain kind of values, you know, take out red eye, things like that. Absolutely. So, so you think the dimension is uh, kind of like pre Photoshop world where, you know, I may be sitting here thinking, when am I ever going to need to put a 3d object in a photo? But you know, I guess after people can use it and use it simply, you're saying that there's going to be use cases for this. I, I, I think so. And, and part of what made Photoshop more, um, more commonplace 
is the advent of digital cameras and, and cheap digital cameras. So everybody is able to grab an image without having to take a photo and get it developed and scanned and so on. So there became a need for editing photos and people started getting into it because their capability was increased with that hardware. I think one of the things that's going to push having 3D capability be, be more uh, democratized is having a 3D scanner that allow you to uh, basically capture in 3D space the model of an object that's sitting right in front of you. And there's a few things that, that kind of do that and they're, they're kind of cool to play around with. And professionally in, in graphics and visual effects use, they're, they're definitely useful tools where you can scan an object and, and get a geometry mesh. Uh, but it's still, I think the workflow is still a little too clunky, a little too in depth. But I think that's the, where we're headed. Right. And as a matter of fact, I, I know I, I wrote a, a an opinion piece about this a long time ago in some publication. I think eventually even our desktops, our interfaces in uh, Windows or or Mac OS could also become three dimensional. Where instead of just laying your icons down on a flat 2D plane, you're able to kind of reach into and move out of that room. So you have more of a three-dimensional interface with just your OS. And I think that's going to be part of making this a much wider uh, uh, adoption as well. Now, I, I so, don't know of any OSs that are currently doing this, but well, I, and you take a look. And, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, and I kind of mean that, uh, you know, we almost kind of do that already where essentially it's like a file system where you have like subfolder, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. where, you know, instead of navigating through folder after folder, it'd be like you kind of reach into a folder and reach past things. And Absolutely. So, so, Absolutely. Yeah, so, so same idea, but more intuitive. And, you know, to your point way at the beginning, uh, sometimes just a graphical uh, way to show that kind of data is much more mm -hmm. intuitive than, you know, just kind of subfolders and things like that so real quick that one right. uh another point i wanted to make real quick was that you thought uh the ability to, to create your own assets because adobe says you know I'm, I'm reading their website here they're going to you know kind of make their own assets but mm -hmm. being able to make your own 3d assets we've had a bunch of companies over the past two three four years who are working on a system to essentially you put your phone in a holder and it'll spin around, take pictures, and essentially turn your smartphone into a 3D scanner. So, absolutely, you know, same absolutely. kind of idea. It, it, you know, putting putting objects that you want to put in and creating these assets more easily. There's your work for, There's your workflow for you. It's uh, you know, your phone can be that part of the puzzle as well. Absolutely, and and, and part of that is called photogrammic uh, photogrammetry where you take different perspectives of a photo or different angles of the same thing with your camera and the computer interpolates because it understands the perspective and understands your camera and can tell, oh yeah, that's, that object is so many inches away from the lens and so on. Mm -hmm. And it can sort of interpolate and create a 3D model based on taking pictures around something, for example. And and I think the the more clean and the easier and the more uh, the higher fidelity that becomes like digital cameras you know 20 years ago i think it, it's going to become um something that we all just sort of do because being able to see something in three dimensions uh opens up for lack of a better word a whole new dimension to us and and allows the uh, illustrative qualities of what we're saying and what we're trying to get across to be that much more effective. Uh, and, and again, it goes back to this sort of project that I'm working on is, is a way to, to take some very complex information and boil it down so that lots of people can understand and be like, oh, okay, I see what your plan is. And, and that really with, with just some diagrams and, and talking and pointing at stuff, isn't as effective as really getting in there and being able to 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 just put your hands in there and pull it apart and take a look at a cross section and being able to to see how deep something a hole is or 
of being able to see how bumpy something is uh, really makes you want to move your head around it. And that's where 3D space comes in. Um, and I'm currently I'm, I'm teaching a, a, a class where I'm teaching the, the introductions of animation using uh, Autodesk's Maya software. And there's a lot of interest from a wider array of of students that want to kind of get into it and know it. And I still find myself struggling to answer the questions like, um, isn't there an easier way to do this or a faster way to do this? And, <laughs> and, and that's the Holy grail. And that's, that's, I think a, a good step for dimension is sort of creating this library. You can grab all sorts of different stuff. Uh, and you said you, you may not, uh, think of a reason why you may need to put a 3d object in your scene. Uh, but you'd be surprised if you actually give it a give it a whirl. If you're photoshopping or editing a photo or designing a web page, you may think like, yeah, you know what? It'll be really nice to put a you know a, a glass of soda as an icon. Um, but all the images I'm finding in clip art and on Google Images, they're not quite right. But if you were able to take that glass of soda and just move it just right and get just the right color and lighting on it. It'll look perfect in your design, and you will be hooked. I gotcha. And I, yeah. as I, as I sent you an article, uh, I'm not sure if you got it, but uh, it's from Engadget, mm -hmm. Snapchat, kind of the same thing. But I think it's uh, you know obviously we were talking about 3D objects and putting them into standard photos. That's something that I think Snapchat explains very easily because you know they are able to put characters or uh you know different effects that uh Absolutely. you know as you move your camera they they look like the effects are are three-dimensional so i sent you an article and this one from a gadget that they have a new um let, let me get this right it's a new lens studio that essentially you upload your own assets, you know, you either video game characters or things like this. This is obviously going to be for content creators and they're designing an easier way to put, uh, you know, your own assets into mm -hmm. augmented reality with, uh, with Snapchat. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, I guess between the Adobe and between Snapchat, how, how far do we take, how, how far does AR and, you know, kind of 3d, manipulation kind of go in our everyday lives i think it, it can go really uh, exceedingly far i mean there's so many there's so many uses for it not just in content creation but visualizing uh in, in architecture in games entertainment uh, there's all sorts of things you can do um so basically the the, the premise with with what's going on with this sort of uh augmented reality is when you're able to really sense the depth of objects in what you're seeing. So let's say you've got an AR where you're uh, superimposing a character, a CG character, into your phone as you're looking at it at the camera live. It really is uh, important for the camera or the software accessing the camera to be able to judge, okay, here's the floor and a couple of feet away is a chair and there's a table and there's a bookshelf and that, that sort of thing so that they can more precisely position that character, have them standing on the floor, have them standing behind the chair but in front of the bookshelf and to be able to uh, create that illusion to make augmented reality um kind of scary and kind of creepy <laughs> in a way where um it looks real i mean right now it just it's kind of a super imposition where it's just it's sitting on top of what you're looking at through your camera but if you were able to actually push it behind stuff and intelligently yes. understand the location and then know oh okay there's an object in front i need to cut that out and put it over my cg character render to give that sense of depth. And I think that's that's where probably the next steps of, of the technology is going to go with with these camera with with Lytro and um, these cameras basically are trying to capture depth as well as the picture itself. So it knows that the chair you're looking at, you know, it's green and it's got a cushion where you see it in the in the photo, but that it it is also you know, six feet away and is one foot wide and four feet 
tall, for example. So that's that's where the technology is going right now. And, and in the in entertainment field with motion picture cameras, that's going to be a really big, um, big selling point because that may very quickly obviate or get rid of the need for shooting on a live uh, on a green screen stage where the camera will be able to all already know where to mat out the people that would have already been standing in front of green. And then you don't have to worry about all the time, money and effort that it takes to get a green screen uh, lit and set up and, and shot and then processed after. So there's yeah. there's a lot of pushes in those areas. You're going to see definite definite advancements over the coming years in in that technology, and it'll go into the consumer market just like digital cameras did many years ago. Yeah, I, that is one that I hope that they really get figured out quickly. And I know it's not an easy problem. Like uh, intuitively, you're thinking, uh, like you said, just if there's an object in front of it. Uh, turn it off, and then as soon as that object moves, turn it back on. Like it shouldn't be, exactly. uh, it shouldn't be that yeah. hard. But that's right. one thing where, like, even if you pull out your phone and you have Snapchat and you get like a character or something like that that's dancing around on your screen, uh, what I'm talking about is if you just put your hand in front of the camera, now it looks like the character is sitting on your hand. And exactly. you know, when yeah. it looked like it was five feet away, that's one thing. Now it looks like it's two inches away. That's that's a problem for you know realistically believing something is occupying that space. So without a doubt, yeah, and and uh, smarter people than I, I'm sure, are stumped on how to do that. But um, yeah, and and I'm not sure if uh, if this leads into this other article you have from Graphic Speak, but real time ray tracing on your phone is that kind of what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So um, we've been talking about the the sensor and the ability to to put something in place. This is the the back end of this. This is the next step in the conversation, which is visualizing uh, with a high accuracy what this thing looks like. So what ray tracing is basically when you're when you're rendering something out of the computer, you know, it's it's scanning back and forth and figuring out oh. The object over here is a little bit blue and over there is a little bit red and so on and and renders the colors to give you uh, an image. What ray tracing is, it's a form of rendering that allows you to basically trace how light travels from a light source to an object, how, re how it reflects off of that object and then goes into your eye or the camera. And that gives a much better, higher fidelity image in that render. Like, for example, you'll be able to see accurate shadows. You'll be able to see accurate reflections. Um, and it just it looks better. It looks nicer. You've heard uh, HDRI in games before, of course, with high dynamic range environments. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't really be possible without ray tracing, to, to my understanding. Uh, but ray tracing has been around for a really, really long time. Certainly when when I was getting into CG many, many years ago, it was around, but it was clunky, it was slow, and everybody tried to work around it. Now every application has advanced ray tracing algorithms. They can do some, some great, great uh, light bouncing and things like that to simulate real uh, light. So... This real-time ray tracing is really, re really interesting. If they're able to, I guess, compress the data or compress the computations, that your phone can ray trace, can first sense the lighting in your area and say, oh, you know what, it's kind of a sunny day. It's, a, it's about 11 o'clock. The sun is bright, mostly overhead. And there's a couple of uh, lamps right next to the camera it can calculate how much light is actually there that it's seeing through the camera and then take an object and recreate in CG that lighting environment so that the object looks like it's right there under that sun and next to those lights. That, I and, and I guess that 
question uh, that makes me question what is possible if like let's say they got ray tracing down uh lighting mm -hmm. on three you know on on uh, on imposed objects is perfect they look like other regular objects um I, I guess what does that do to the entertainment industry what does that do for uh you know kind of games that happen in augmented reality where you have objects you have let's say a foot you know, a, 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 let's say a soccer ball um, mm -hmm. you know, and you could play a soccer game where the other players are completely superimposed and they look natural. The ball lo looks superimposed, yeah, but right. you just wear a headset and, you know, you run around like an idiot in an open, empty field. I mean, yeah. are things like that possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. And as we, uh, as we get near going to see ready player one. <laughs> uh, or if you've if you've read the book, uh, there's there's lots of implications, and uh, of course the Matrix is probably the darkest of those implications. Um, yeah, anything's really possible, and and I've spoken uh, um, at a at a few different podcasts and, and and articles about this before. I mean, I think there are some some um, uh, ramifications when it comes to the 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 right or wrong uses of this sort of technology that, that we have to grapple with. And uh, I'm not sure we really have discussed those too much yet because technology moves really, really quickly. So, you know, it's still in uh, early stages and getting photo accurate ray tracing real time is still, you know, not quite there. Even on pretty high powered machines, there's still a little bit of a lag uh, on like super duper machines that have uh, you know Tesla cards in them, um, uh, so it's a little way off. But seeing that they're developing this to a a good to a good point actually at this right. point on your phone, it's kind of promising for really neat looking AR games. I mean, imagine if your Pokemon Go was so much more accurate, you could you kind of see. I don't know, like Pikachu. I don't know if he's really a character you go after in Pokemon yeah, or not. But of course, yes. let's say you have a Pikachu standing six feet in front of you and trying to catch it with your little red and white ball. If it really looks like it's standing next to the tree that's right in front of you, that would be kind of cool. Yeah, no, no, it it, uh, it would, you know, then it looks like a Pikachu that is actually standing under a tree and not just a Pikachu that is superimposed on your screen. It's uh, absolutely right. Right, so right. Make, makes perfect sense. So we, uh, yeah, we're about to run into a break really quick, but uh, speaking about that light sensing, that depth thing, uh, obviously there was a technology called, well, there was a company that developed a technology, uh, Lytro, and mm -hmm. they had developed a camera that you could change the uh the focus you know kind of after you took a photo you took it with uh, with right. the camera yeah. and you could focus in on different things so we have two stories related to them uh i think we're going to get started with uh this one from graphic speak and then we'll talk about the fact that well google you know w has purchased the company Lytro, and i guess what google could do with that technology and you know because Let's face it, Google is in our lives for better or worse, and what they do with it, it's going to affect everyone. So, uh, Darren, for like a minute, what's up with this Lightfield Lab? Because, again, I've heard of Lytro, but this is a Lytro spinoff. What are they claiming here? Right. So, basically, if you kind of go backwards, instead of just capturing that that depth data uh, and that visual data in, in three dimensions, this would be kind of projecting like a hologram or a holographic display um, with with more of a, um, a sense of depth to it as opposed to a flat screen. So, you know, all the movies that you've seen where you're seeing like a three-dimensional interactive sort of hologram in some space station, this is where it's starting from. Gotcha, gotcha. So, all right, you know, we're gonna stop it there, and folks, we're gonna come right back to uh, to this conversation, and we're gonna talk again about you know this claim, and obviously this article does claim that they plan to change video forever, and you know they might. So, with that being said, everyone, you're listening to the Computer America Show. We are talking to Mr. Darius Derek Shani, and folks, again, if you want to check out the uh, computeramerica.com in the show notes, we have a link to all of these articles as well as anything else we cover here in the show today. So the music, 
which is right there, means that we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we have, you know, we're going to talk, finish up about Lytro. And, uh, you know, we actually have some other articles about GPUs and with $150,000 worth of GPUs and the Unreal Engine, we get to see real-time ray-traced Star Wars. So this is, again, it all folds into each other, and I'm really liking how this is working out. Dish TV is better than cable TV. Why? Because you can save 45% on packages compared to your high-priced cable bill. Wow. Take those giant scissors out and cut the cable and save with Dish TV. Plus, you get a free DVR upgrade to record your favorite shows and free installation. And with Dish Anywhere, you can watch TV for free on your mobile device. Act fast. You can save hundreds of dollars. Does your cable company do that for you? I don't think so. Get all the best TV programming at your fingertips at a fraction of the price of cable TV. So say adios, arrivederci, goodbye to the high cable bill, and save up to 45% on Dish TV packages today. These are limited time offers and can change at any time. Call fast. 800-471-5325. 800-471-5325. 800-471-5325. That's 800 471 15325. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare. What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low cost airlines. With one call to low cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airline travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32 minutes past the hour as we continue on here. And yeah, we're talking with Darius Shani. We are, you know, as I said before, I'm liking how all of this is, you know, kind of uh, daisy chained together because uh, we are about to get into Lytro and we're going to talk about, you know, kind of this is uh, the spinoff, which happens a lot. You know, the the, the researchers, the people behind it who develop a certain technology, be it self-driving cars, be it, uh, you know, some kind of lightro like technology, they instantly become highly valuable experts in a new field. And they generally leave the company pretty quickly after it's purchased by a much larger company so that they can then, you know, start a new company and continue their research, sell to another company, essentially, you know, just kind of spreading the love and, you know, their expertise as far as they can. Uh, also, hey, very, very lucrative. So with that being said, these guys were from Lightro, as I understand it. And uh, Darius, if you'd like to, again, pick it up. Um, yeah, Lightfield Lab, $7 million. And what exactly are they trying to do? Because changing changing video fundamentally, like, like don't get me wrong, it'd be kind of cool, but people, people lost their minds when we went from 24 to 48 frames per second and they were pissed. Uh, what are they going to do that's going to change video for the better? Well, you know, that's, that's a good question. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure how to answer that. It's sort of like when... When Segway say uh, said that it's going to change uh, cities forever, and it 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 didn't, you know. True. Um, so you know, there's some some marketing speak going on over here. I think what it'll do is give us another way of display um, where we can feel like we're immersed uh, in the display. So right now with 3D, you put on your glasses, you sit, you watch a movie that's that's in stereoscopic or, or 3D, and you get a slightly better sense of being part of what's uh, what's in the in the film or in the video. This, I think takes that uh, further where, well, let's see, in 
Disney, uh, Disneyland, I was uh, waiting in line for one of the rides, as you do for hours on end. <laughs> yeah. And um, they had this this neat display where they take um, a bit of fog, a bit of water mist uh, that they're you know pumping out like a like a little bit of a fog machine, and in there they're projecting sort of this sort of, for lack of a better word, a hologram. Mm -hmm. Where it's sort of like, you know, you're seeing it, but it's sort of 3D. So instead of just having a a flat screen that they're projecting something onto, they're projecting at a uh, three-dimensional perspective. So you could kind of move around and see the perspective of what you're seeing change a bit. Um, And that's, of course, because, you know, the, 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 the fog in the air gives you, instead of a flat screen gives you more uh, of a volume that you can project into. Uh, Again, sort of holographic. So I think this is taking an image uh, into the camera and being able to manipulate it in such a way that it mimics how you perceive stuff with your eye and then reprojecting it out in such a way to give you that illusion that um, I can sort of maybe reach out and touch it because um, it looks 3D as opposed to being just a flat screen in front of me. So I think this is one of the things they're going for. It's still definitely early to say, but right. um, I'm guessing this is what the you know what the what the brouhaha is going to be about. Whether it's going to change video forever or not, we'll we'll have well, to wait and see yeah. when forever comes the the article of course uh they bring up that point that anyone out there who has ever watched star trek uh you know that the idea of the holodeck that you enter Mm -hmm. a room and you have an environment built around you that you can then interact with um yep that's what they're claiming so it's 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 vr without goggles in in many ways so if we fast forward, I don't know, a hundred years uh, with this technology, mm-hmm. we could have something that gives you a hollow deck display. So again, instead of sitting in a movie theater and and looking at a screen that's you know several several yards in front of you, you're looking at uh, images all around you. Now, of course, Star Trek hol- with the holodeck. I mean, people are interacting and they're touching and picking things up. So this is this is still science fiction, um, but this gives you the idea that you could basically put the goggles on for VR, move your head around. Mm-hmm. What you're seeing in there now, imagine without your goggles, right. moving your head around without the goggles, and still being able to see what you would have seen inside of VR. And I guess this is why the researchers, or I assume, uh, you know, the the people behind Lytro would be interested in doing something like this, is because you need that ability to, you know, if you maybe, again, kind of lean forward a little bit, if you were actually, you Mm -hmm. know, kind of in one of these situations, maybe it would be out of focus because it judged you for, you know, 10 feet away, now you're 9 feet, 8 inches away, and it's a little fuzzy to you because it's out of focus. So I guess that's where that light field technology that Lightro utilizes would be helpful because you could change it on the fly and, you know, it, all, all the data is there to manipulate yeah. the image, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's, that's a good way to, uh, to see it. So, and of course, you know, it's, it's just the beginnings, mm-hmm. um, but I think this is where, this is where the, the, technology is trying to move to it's basically a higher fidelity way of displaying what is uh what is intended a film vr whatever and it's coming from the technology and from the research of how to capture that data making cameras that can see that that uh and and record that sort of depth and dimension so they're they're very hand in hand, and it doesn't surprise me at all that this is a spinoff from the Lytro folks who are pioneering a lot of that capturing uh, technology. Right. So now we have uh, this next article also sent you, and it's also available in the show notes. But uh, Google 
I believe you've heard of them. They own the world. Uh, they you recently certainly do. Yeah, and so they recently acquired Lytro for about forty million dollars. Where, yeah, you know, hey, that, the, and forty million dollars—a lot of money. But apparently, the company, uh, I guess, either between patents or personnel assets, whatever it may be, is valued at uh, well over that at about three hundred and sixty. So. I guess my question to you is that again, looking into uh, you know what might be a hundred years is something, but looking into because Google doesn't work on a hundred years, uh, or they might, but as far as I know, Google works on maybe a one to two year turnaround when they can actually mm-hmm. put something out that people can use. What do you think Google can do with this? Is this like a Street View technology where it would take better Street View uh, images or? What can Google do with Lytro that would that people would you know kind of enjoy using? I think Street View would have uh, a, a whole new life to it, uh, depending on it, how they use the Lytro technology. If they put it on their street cameras, um, you could get a much better sense of depth from it. Um, there's a technology called lidar, which is basically uh, scanning technology and it's used a lot in construction as well as uh, entertainment where you take it on location uh, like a construction site for example and you use the lidar to basically scan the environment and what it gives back to you is uh, depth data so if you're scanning a hill uh, that you want to basically build a house on this will give you a very good uh, geometry representation of the slope of the hill and the the bumpiness and the surface properties and things like that. Mm-hmm. So if if something like this were uh, quick, easy, fast on top of a Google car, you could start seeing SketchUp models of your neighborhood uh, so much easier to to download. I mean, we saw a little bit of that already a while back, where you could download SketchUp models of cities and stuff like that that were basically interpolated from satellite and street view data would just take that to uh, uh, another level. Um, I think one of the the big reasons uh, that they acquire them, that Google acquired them, is so that they can have a another dog in the race when it comes to VR and AR. Um, you know, with with uh, with Oculus, and with HTC Vive and with Sony PlayStation, they're still. Are you still telling me at, that Google Cardboard is not a legitimate competitor? Uh, you know, uh, my son has one, and it's kind of fun, <laughs> but after a while, it just it hurts my nose. Okay. So, um, but yeah, no, it's totally cool. Like my son and I will will throw it on my phone and sit there and and you know go to the Himalayas, um, and it's neat, um, but. A friend of mine told me if you're going to get VR, you want to get the PlayStation. And the only reason to get a PlayStation VR is for some Star Wars game. Because when you're sitting in the cockpit, you can just look around with the goggles on and just have this amazing experience of being in a in a dogfight. And that, that sounds really cool. And that's that's really where it's at. And I think uh, Google wants, wants to get in on that. And I think Lytro would be... A good addition, and it, it's not about the products that they have necessarily, um, but about the patents and the technology and the minds, uh, the the information, the research uh, that they're going to. And Google can certainly put a couple of dollars down and expand whatever Lytro wants to do. Right, and according to the article that we have here, uh, looks like they introduced something called Welcome to Light Fields uh, in right. Steam. It's an app, and uh, it and honestly, looking through that little app that Google put out, because again, this was actually put out by Google, um, you can kind of see where they've they've wanted to. I'm not sure their actual progress on capturing not just storefronts but going inside of buildings and stores Mm -hmm. so you can look around and even houses um this kind of technology they kind of show it off here where you can actually go in kind of lean to the left and you know kind of see around a chair or you know you just it just builds a more immersive uh vr experience so it looks like they're gonna uh either for animation or for app building or for just 
you know, I guess general capturing of good footage, um, yeah, it looks like Google is definitely investing in AR and VR. It's uh, it's a good thing to see for sure. Um, so, all right, so there's that. And so to, I think the last one we're going to talk about graphics wise, and then we'll jump into something uh, maybe not so lighthearted, but, you know, still equally important. Uh, Darius, I, I believe you should have the article. It's, uh, it's from Ars Technica and Kyle Orland saying about uh, the Unreal Engine. Very, very popular. I believe free to use. Um, mm-hmm. So a lot of people use it. And about $150,000 worth of GPUs, which is, you know, a lot of GPUs. Uh, going back to ray, uh, ray tracing and, you know, the ability to uh, put light onto objects or shadows and being able to do that in real time. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, we were talking about doing it with mobile phones and mobile cameras. This is a step up. So uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look over this article, but it mm-hmm. uh, looks like they were able to retrace over uh, Star War, uh, the new Star Wars. Yeah, and, and it dovetails nicely with, with the whole idea that it's a capture and output duo that's going to make all this uh, work. And real-time ray tracing is uh, one of the, the, the pivotal points. Um, I, I don't want to harp on the word or the phrase ray tracing too much, um, but it's it's sort of the, the, the core foundation of this rendering technology. But Really what you want is photo real or photo accurate real time rendering. Uh, and that includes ray tracing and seeing shadows and, and reflections. It also includes global illumination, which uh, has light bouncing uh, around. Like if you looked at the bottom of your desk, there's no light directly hitting the bottom of your, of your table, but you can still see the bottom of your table because light is bouncing everywhere all over in your room, bouncing off the floors and the walls and so on. And there's a great deal of lighting that happens with this secondary or this indirect illumination. So that's part of the equation as well is to mimic what light really does and how to get a calculation based off of that to run in real time is definitely, definitely going to be very difficult. And you need a lot of uh, processing power, certainly this $150,000 $150,000 GPU will come in handy. I'd love to play Rainbow Six <laughs> on it sometime. Um, but it also comes with um, the, the the ability to run it quickly and eventually run it cheaply. And that, I think, is going to end up being a holy grail. However, I do caution against... Um, being too wary or, or not being wary enough of getting to that point where we're recreating things uh, photorealistically in real time without really challenge, uh, without really uh, dealing with or addressing the challenging ethical questions of how do we use it and when do we use it? Because this could very easily be used to just explode the whole fake news phenomenon to an incredibly new and very disturbing sort of level. So, so yeah, and, and, and just real quick, um, you know, and by the way, at the at the very bottom of the article, uh, at, at the top of the article, they have the stills, and at the bottom of the article, they have the the video, the one minute demo uh, that is, you know, applying the lighting and uh, and, and you're right, uh, don't harp too much on ray tracing, but one thing that it kind of showed you in the video was that. Uh, you know, the elevator doors open, there's a stormtrooper with uh, very, very reflective armor. Mm -hmm. And in that armor, you were able to see that, you know, maybe, maybe in past video games, it would have just, you know, if you looked into the armor, it would have shown maybe, you know, whatever they put on the armor, maybe closed doors Mm -hmm. or just whatever still. This time they, you know, because the light is, you know, kind of reflecting from the scene, you see the doors open, you see them closed, and Absolutely. it's much more realistic, it, just to your point. So, yeah, we, that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's what seeing is. It's, it's seeing reflections. Uh, everything that you see is a reflection of light off of that object, whether it's, you know, the doors opening and closing. So running running that in real time is really super super critical to to getting the environment 
to properly reflect in what's happening. And if you take that a step further and you have that stormtrooper standing in front of your your uh, front door and you've got AR or uh, AR goggles on or you're looking through your phone and you physically open your actual door and there's the CG chrome storm, uh, stormtrooper, mm-hmm. the, the ray tracing, the, the real-time rendering would show your reflection right in that chrome uh and that's that's like stupid difficult to to figure out how to do (laughs) but that's the idea and doing it in a full virtual environment is definitely the first place to be and that's where unreal rate uh real-time rendering and that's the basis behind uh dimension as well the folks behind uh, this great render uh engine called v-ray uh, have incorporated their real-time photo real rendering into that Adobe product because without it, uh, Dimension wouldn't be able to give you feedback on what this object looks like when you manipulate it, which you need that sort of real-time feedback when you're a graphic artist trying to put something together. Right. So it all it's, it's all kind of based on the same thing, which is I want it to look good and I want it right now. Right. And and so and of course, uh, video games are going to benefit immensely from this uh, movies. Uh, a lot Huge. of this can absolutely. So, so movies do a lot of that in post. But uh, but of course, if they could do it in real time, I'm sure they would definitely choose that, uh, you know, preferably. So video games, they look photorealistic. And then to your point, you were making a little bit earlier, the ethical questions of this, because I, I had the same thought. And I'm going to combine another technology that we've talked about here on the show. And so you can make footage that looks real. Lighting is right. Everything is right. Everything Mm -hmm. looks amazing. You know, the only thing that may be uh, wrong would be if a giant rubber ducky was giving a presidential announcement instead of, you know, uh, you know, things that, you know, would never happen. But then you mix it with a technology that we talked about where, Think of it like Photoshop for voices, where because we have so much data, so many examples, clips, media of people talking, we can recreate anyone's voice with inflection, with tone. We can have them say things they, they would never, ever, ever say, but we can say it in their voice. So mix it between that and real time video. You, you know, what kind of ethical questions do you kind of have and and Darius because you know when Photoshop became more and more popular we all kind of sat back as a human race because I'm going to generalize Mm. a lot here and say well maybe it was photoshopped now we look at every photo ever and say maybe it was photoshopped do we have to do that with video now because it used to be if we have a recording or we have a video that was the end of it you know that that was proof now do we have right. to sit back and say maybe that was photoshopped, you know, quote unquote? Absolutely, and and depressingly so. I don't think we're at a point with animation and um, digital humans where the the big majority or even a small majority of people would be able to would not be able to tell that it's CG. I think there's still. Uh, a little ways to go in how animation uh, and and digital humans look mm-hmm. and move. Uh, so I think lots of people will still kind of look at something and be like, that doesn't look right, you know. Um, and I think I'm more sensitive to it than lots of uh, lots of people. Um, but you know, uh, the 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 Sean Young character in the new Blade Runner was was CG. She was the young version. And looking at tests and how the the wonderful visual effects created that look, you know, you look at what she looked like before and what she looks like now digitally, it's uncanny. It's kind of scary. But in the moment when you're watching it and you're watching the lips move in the animation and it felt and I knew immediately that that it wasn't quite real. Same thing with um I think it was uh, Emperor Tarkin, uh, one of the Star Wars characters. The same yeah. thing with uh, yeah. Leia, a little same bit thing in the latest. With, same thing with and ruined the movie for a lot of people. Uh, Batman versus Superman. Uh, oh. Superman was not allowed to shave his mustache, and so they CGI'd it out the entire time. Same thing. Absolutely, uh, same thing. I was look. I didn't know about the mustache story until I 
after I saw the the film. Okay, so, but I was so they did pretty going, good. Why yeah. on earth did they replace his head or his face? I couldn't figure it out. My friend told me it's the mustache. I'm like, oh, mm. so that that's just an unfortunate, you know, series of events that you know speak to the to the business uh, of, of right. filmmaking. Um, but yeah, I'm still, you know, I don't know how long it'll be. I think it's within a generation or two that we really, really do need to talk about these. And I know, I know there must be having government level talks about these capabilities. I, I know it, it it must be happening, uh, where, they are assessing. Um, I don't know for fact, of course, but it's got to be happening. I, I where they're I really assessing, so. you know, how people can do, and you know, if, if North Korea or or Syria or some or the Taliban, if they're able to amp up their propaganda machine. I mean, there people still believe the Earth is flat. No offense to to those people, but no, 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 believe... no, 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 full offense to those people, please, full <laughs> offense. <laughs> I um. Yeah, but you know, it, it's, it's so you could you could make people believe almost anything, but when it becomes difficult for the majority of people to look at it, just like you said, what was that video CGified? Was that photoshopped? Right. Is that news footage real? Uh, you know, is is the rubber ducky addressing Congress? Right. Real. That that. I think is is something that that we as a, a race, as people, as governments, as societies, uh, need to talk about a little bit more. And and part of it, I think, will stem from all these studies that we're doing. And a couple of these articles, I think we have on the show page, talk about screen time and kids being happy or unhappy or having friends and not having friends and just trying to get your kid off of the computer to go ride a bicycle or something nowadays. Seems to be um, a lot of discussion around it, and I think we need to grow that discussion and start really looking at the fact that you know Emperor Tarkin could be uh, Osama bin Laden in a video from the Taliban that could just reinvigorate a whole lot of terrible stuff. Right. Um, so there's there's things to be said, and and there's a there was a magazine. Forgive me, I forget. I think it was Vogue. Uh, that recently um, uh, declared that whenever they Photoshop or airbrush a photo in their photo shoots, they're going to disclaim it. And I think that is a wonderful, wonderful step in in that discussion. I think France actually, like the country, France uh, is mandating. Oh, all be, of France, right? Be, yeah, is mandating because you know France is huge into fashion and, of course, a lot of photo shoots. They're mandating that uh, any you know any touch ups have to be with an asterisk saying this is you know this has been retouched. Don't try to you know yeah. get your face to look exactly like this because you never will. Um, yes, so, absolutely. Yeah, so I so think, little. Um, sorry, go ahead. I, I think it's important for people to to know. And then they can judge for themselves. I, I think a lot of people will, will kind of look at my Facebook comments about, oh, my gosh, this is happening and let's talk about it ethically as like you can't stop technology. Why do you want to stop innovation? And it's not so much about that. It's it's about uh, being prepared for it and knowing what to do with it. But that's, uh, a, that's, that's important. That's a really good point you just made, though, was that – we didn't have that conversation really about when we can alter photos to the point where you don't notice. And it led to unrealistic body image. It led to a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people being uh, mm -hmm. essentially depressed that they can't look like a model. And it's like models Absolutely. don't look like models, um, right. you know, because and they're, it's, it's, they're art. It's unfair to them. And it's unfair to, it's unfair to everybody to have that sort of uh, misconception that, my girlfriend or my boyfriend has to look like this. And when they don't, because they don't, there's an expectation and there's a disappointment. And, and I think relationships and social uh, engagements uh, suffer from that sort of thing. So um, far be it for me to, to, to say this often, but I applaud the, uh, the, the French for this sort of move. And I think it should be something that's on a, on a global level and should be discussed and taken even further with in light of this new technology that that is literally literally just ripping through and and making amazing advancements on a daily basis
right and uh you know hey this is the conversation that i think i really do want to pick up next month so we'll uh Sounds you know, great. We'll, we'll look into this but uh everyone so the whole hour you know this hour flew on by darius derek shawnee our graphics expert and soon to be our ethics expert uh yeah talking <laughs> all things graphics so if you missed today's show check us out wherever podcasts are heard by the way we have a new link up uh, at computer america for tune in radio so hey feel free to check us there as well so darius until next month i hope that your schedule uh lessons if you wanted to but uh good luck sir thanks very much all right always so, a pleasure to be on our pleasure our pleasure so everyone else out there be sure to tune in tomorrow where we have a full episode of computer and technology news and uh hey until next time Thank you for tuning in to Computer America, and uh, yeah, catch you again. Bye, everyone. <laughs>